impossible to quantify they are they cannot be put it into measurables mathematically they are generally subjective in nature and this kind of research uses various methods for data collection data analysis we do focus groups we do in-depth interviews an observation research method is used we generally adopt a case study approach an ethnographic approach and if we talk about a quantitative research this is concerned purely with the measurement of any kind of phenomena which is validated using statistical methodical or any kind of computational techniques. This data is very objective in nature and this kind of research is supported by an experimental research which is done in a confined environment in an environment of labs where you have proper measuring instruments, you involve surveys in this and then there is primary and secondary data analysis involved. Now, what is a literature review? A literature review is basically a gist, a summary of studies on any given topic that provides important insights. It is also referred to as a thorough and well-written literature review, which synthesizes the current state of knowledge. It will give you a summary of the entire state of knowledge available on the research topic or your area. And it brings together different conversations. Yes, the word is conversations that is used. This might be rooted in different paradigms. You may talk about the pros, you may talk about the cons, you can even talk about what has been done in what aspect, what research methodology. So basically, this is, this is a key tool that is used to manage the diversity of knowledge for a specific academic inquiry. If I sum it up in a line, the aim of literature review is to enable the researcher to map, assess, evaluate the existing intellectual territory, which means to assess the existing set of knowledge on the research area that you are overlooking, and then to specify a research question which you're going to answer through your research, which you're going to develop the existing body of knowledge further to answer that specific research question through your research. Generally, if we divide the research into different stages, there are some key terms we use, the identification of the problem, selection of research technique, then the problem definition, which includes a statement of research objectives, some hypotheses are framed, selection of the basic research method, which is called the research design, moving on to the experiment survey, what kind of techniques, later on data collection, data processing. These are different, different steps that you adopt for any kind of research and whatever typology of research you're taking, the problem identification, beginning from problem identification and coming to finalizing of your research design. This entire thing comes under literature review. You, you derive this from the literature review. You start studying all the primary, secondary sources. You conduct a basic survey. You define the problem. You define your aims. You will see what has been already done, what methodology has been adopted. And on the basis of that, you select a research design for your specific research. I know this section has already been taken, but just to give you an overlook of it, that there are separate components of a research paper. The first is the abstract, which should give you the title, the introductory paragraph, as well as the important keywords which define your research area. The second is the introduction, which will comprise of the problem, the purpose statement, what is the aim of this specific research, what objectives are you going to achieve, what is the justification for conducting this research. The next section is the literature review. Then you define your research methodology, what you're going to adopt for it, the results and discussion. And finally, the conclusion where you talk about limitations, future research directions, ending on to references. So if you consider out of all these, literature review is a very important section of a research paper as well as a report. It can be a research proposal for a PhD document. It can be a research proposal for a dissertation for MR or for a research project also that nowadays we are submitting for various organizations for funding. So each of this has a background literature review on the basis of which the 
researcher has to frame his purpose statement, aim and objectives and justify the research. Now, what is the purpose of a literature review? Uh, a very uh, well-known author once said, the uh, task of a literature review is to build an argument. It is not a library. It is just not compilation of the other's works telling, sourcing what they have written, but it is to build an argument. You use already published research to tell something which your research is going to answer. Now, it is also a means of demonstrating an author's knowledge about a particular field of study. It informs you of the influential researchers and research groups in the field. There are some senior researchers who already set up precedents in that area. They've already uh, developed some scales. So you need to know what research has already been done, what are the scales available, what are the various constructs that have been already identified in your research area. And when you are able to write that document with some modification, that document is a legitimate and publishable scholarly document where you very clearly source the previous researchers and present your work that where is it leading to it is also called as delimiting the research problem you start defining your boundaries you say what has been already done seeking new lines of inquiry what are the future directions for your research gaining methodological insights you make comprehensive tables on the basis of literature review you explain these are the concepts which have been answered this methodology has been adopted it was a qualitative or a quantitative research and so on these statistical tools have been adopted and how the current research is going to be different from the previous ones identifying recommendations for further research seeking support for grounded theories. There are some theories in your area which have already been established. They may not have been uh, mathematically validated. So your research is an attempt to validate those theories or work on further and in what direction. So this is entire, that is the purpose of literature review, why you need to do a effective literature review. I'll show you a glimpse. This is one of my papers that was published in Material Today Proceedings. If you look at the abstract, this is a normal abstract that we all are familiar with. And what are the important sections? What should be there in this abstract? Number one, distinguishing what has been done from what needs to be done. For example, here we say that the advanced technology and innovation, a high range of types of building materials is available, but they have very high embodied energy due to chemical processes and maybe some other factors. So this gives the reader an idea that the pretext a uh, base has been set for this research where they are trying to distinguish that this has already been done. And there is a small issue in that, that whatever new material is available, it has high embodied energy. Discovering other important variables. What are you looking forward? For example, this paper was on bamboo, which is available in nature. The study has been based on few tests where we are defining the methodology that has been used for this particular study and then synthesizing and gaining a new perspective that this material can be grown at multiple locations. It is replenished easily. It has tremendous potential as a sustainable building material, which means setting the stage for future researches. So this is what is an outcome of the literature review that helps you to establish your research question, your answer to that problem, and then how you going to give a new perspective to the already existing theory on that particular area. How do we write it? How, what do you mean by novelty and research gap while talking about literature review? When you start identifying your problem, whatever area you're researching, some critical discussion, some material that has been published, some research that has been already done, you zero down to some identification of any problem which has not been discussed and which you further refine it to a knowledge gap or a research gap. And on the basis of that, you set your scale for your objectives. Now, without establishing the state of the previous research, 
it is impossible to establish how this new research, how your research will advance the previous research. See, there is no point publishing or researching on something which has already been done by somebody else. Your research should always be a step ahead. It should lead the other researchers into a direction which is unknown. It should lead them to something where research is required and has not been done. So identification of the problem, defining it, Talking about the research gap, framing your objectives, this leads to establishing the novelty of your research, the originality of your research, as well as identification of the research gap. Now, these two aspects are very important, which should be an outcome of your literature review. Again, I will give you an example. This is a paper that was published in Emerald, and this was about memorable tourism experience. So if you look at this abstract, now this is different from the one I showed earlier. That was a, a non-structured abstract. So when we talk about different sections in an abstract, where you do not see one combined paragraph, you have different, different subheads, which is called purpose, the design or the methodology adopted for that research, what approach you've taken, what are the various findings from that, what are the limitations or any kind of implications. These implications can be various type, theoretical implications for theory, these can be practical, managerial implications for the site where it is going to be implemented in the last section if you see carefully is the originality and value now if you have conducted an effective a very thorough literature review you will be able to sum up the originality of your entire 8 10 12 page research paper in one line very crisply that this is something new which is going to be added for example in this paper i have written sr is a new construct it has been sparsely studied with no known study linking three more variables that I was using in my paper. And this kind of um, abstract where you have different sections is called a structured abstract. And this is nowadays being used by some of the peer reviewed journals, Scopus Index journals, and especially the Emerald format is a structured abstract. Moving to the next section where we say, on the basis of the literature review, as you can see the above paragraph, I've quoted some of the researchers and I say that this is the problem. This is the problemization that I'm going to answer. On the basis of this, two questions have been framed. And considering this, the study aims to do this, which means the research gap in the existing knowledge has already been identified and it has been very well quoted. And considering that research gap, that this is the area where very less or very sparse or you know probably maybe sometimes no research has been done so this research will delve into that area and considering that research gap the specific objectives of this study include one two or three whatever objectives you want to define for your research area now, people generally get confused between research gap and research problem. So this was something I found on uh, internet and I really found it very interesting and very crisp that a research gap is an area of interest that hasn't been explored. As I already said, ki previous researches mein usko explore hi kiya gaya, uspe kisi ka dhyan nahi gaya, kisi ne uspe kaam nahi kiya. But research problem is a definite, a clear statement which shows a concern to be addressed that needs to be addressed certain points to a need for meaningful understanding and a need for deliberate investigation. So that is the difference between a research gap. A gap is something, an area which exists while a problem is a finite statement. A research gap identifies a gap in knowledge about a subject over a broader area. Research problem identifies, articulates the need for research. This will ultimately lead you to writing the section which is called the research justification. Research gap is clearly identified from the literature review. And without having a research gap, you cannot submit a research proposal. You cannot submit a research paper. If your paper lacks a research gap, the paper will never be accepted by the top publishers.
However, a research problem, this is formed from the research gap. Aapne identify kar liya, you know that this has not been done. So accordingly, usko justify karne ke liye, you'll start writing, this is the research problem, this is the gap. So the ultimate statement is this leading to the framing of aims and objectives of your study or research. Now, what are the different sources of literature review? The sources for literature review are generally categorized as primary sources or secondary sources. If I talk about primary sources, these include the original information, such as the survey data that is collected by hand or a first person account of any event. It can be an interview I conducted. It can be an interview transcript. Secondary sources include all those sources which have been published or sometimes there are unpublished works that describe, they summarize, they analyze, they kind of interpret or maybe review any existing source. These secondary sources can incorporate primary sources also to support their arguments. So, agar simple language mein samjhenge to primary source is something which I have done on my own and secondary source is a source which I'm using from somebody else published or unpublished works. So ideally a good researcher, a good research should use a combination of both these sources to strengthen the area of research. Giving you a quick overview of what can be the primary sources. They can be your diaries, your audio recordings that you did at some place, your even transcripts your original manuscript, some kind of government document, court records which you have faced, some kind of a speech, empirical study conducted, a statistical data I have obtained. It can be a photograph also, while secondary sources include all those journal articles, textbooks, dictionaries, encyclopedias, biographies. It can be a post, it can be a newspaper article, it can be thesis that may be published or unpublished, can be documentaries and analysis reports too. But typically, since we are talking about this entire series is focusing on research papers. So the typical sources for a research paper include for an effective uh, literature review, it is an electronic database, the journal articles, the conference papers, it can be books, it can be research reports published by the government or by some organizations, it can be the PhD, the master's thesis, the dissertations and the dictionaries, encyclopedias from where we develop operationalization and we start defining our constructs and it can be again magazines and newspaper articles. You can probably take a picture or can note if we think about secondary sources, these are able to identify with an emphasis. So these generally begin with journals in your library or the online journals. So most of the schools have access to a lot of data sources nowadays, Abesco, ProQuest, Science Direct, and many more. You can even turn to books, including books with chapters written by different authors, which are widely being published by Springer, Elsevier. You can scan the earlier dissertations, thesis. These are available on uh, internet sources like Shodh Ganga, Inflipnet, ProQuest, and some university portals also. Read good books on research methods. They will help you to define your research design. Some of the books, Joan Treswell, William Zickman, these are one that are often referred to. Then you need to start your own personal research-based social media account so that you're connected with your fraternity and you know how many people are conducting research on the same area. And what are they looking to? So that can be done through Google Scholar, creating an ORCID ID, a researcher ID. You can log in for an account on ResearchGate, LinkedIn, and so on. Then another important thing is getting an alert for conferences. So you can refer to conferencealerts.com. You start knowing the new themes, the upcoming themes, and sometimes they form a base to give you an idea for developing a research paper. Then newspapers, magazines, any kind of electronic media reports, and especially for architects, we refer to international national reports. If we are in the field of heritage, we refer to ECOMOS reports. Then we have Council of Architecture, Indian IIA. These are the reports that we often refer to for our data analysis and for our literature support. Now, steps in conducting a literature review. There are five major steps that are involved. First is to identify the topic and then the subtopic and then keyword. Now, this is kind of a three-tier thing. You identify the broader area. 
that I, let's say I'm going to research in heritage conservation. Then I moved down, I research, I found that there is something in heritage which talks about living religious heritage or a religious heritage, religious tourism. So from there, I pick up my keywords, uh, heritage approaches, maybe sustainable management, the world heritage sites and so on. These keywords, when you put on the Google Scholar, they will help you identify the direct literature that is available and what has been already done. Identify the sources of information. A list of the sources along with the specific topics should be made. This is very important. Collect the information. Collect information systematically one after the another and never forget to keep a record of the source from where it has been collected. Organize the entire information. You, for your reference, you can develop topics, you can develop sections, you can have folders, whatever is convenient to you. It should be recorded, maintained. You can have Excel file. So writing the literature review again needs, first of all, defining the problem the problem statement, the purpose of the study, what is the intention behind doing this research. Then provide an information about the study's research design method, which means the methodology section, which is a very important section of your research paper. Review the key and relevant results. Now, maybe some of you may have a query that why do we need to study the results? Whatever research you are doing, you need to place your results in comparison to the previous established studies and then compare your results to strengthen the last section of your research paper, which is called generally, which is called result and discussion. I'm describing this on the basis of the common uh, IEMARD format, which I think everybody you know is familiar. The first section is introduction, methodology, analysis, result and discussion. This is a uh, typical format which is uh, expected out of every research paper, which should be clearly visible for its easy publication and publication in good peer-reviewed journals. So point out the technical and methodological flaws in the study. By this, we mean you do not need to have the same results as the previous published study. It's only maintaining it it's only mentioning it and then placing your results in context your results may be the same as previously conducted it may be different both are right there is nothing wrong in that you have to just point out and you have to establish the fact that okay this has already been done and this is different from what has been previously done and you can always mention there is a section very important in uh, the higher end journals where they talk about the limitation section that what were the typical limitations that the authors faced while doing that study and that limitation can be on the basis of the sample available it can be in the context of the study it can be on the population that we targeted so it can be any kind of limitation once you've collected everything up sara pad liya sare sources bhi note kar liye then how do we need to organize our literature review what are we going to do so a general organization is generally said to be an inverted pyramid concept. You pick up your broader topics, go to the subtopics, and then zero down to the study or research area of yours. And this will lead you direct to the research question that you have framed for your study. So there are various methods for organizing the review of literature also. You can do it by subject. If your literature review covers more than one subject, more than one themes, you're talking about different themes, you can do it by theme, by idea, by trend. It can also be on the basis of theory that these different theories have already been studied in this aspect or any kind of major research study. This can be also done on the basis of author you uh, start writing that these were the seminal studies published. They have researched on this. The outcomes of their study were these, the findings were this, and so on. Taking a step or taking a cue from these studies, you move ahead further by an argumentative stance. It can also be chronological. We can start mentioning with the publication that in 1957, the first paper was published on this area, which 
quoted this and then this, and then you slowly move down, gradually explain the trend. Then another way of organizing the literature review paragraph or section can be the methodological part of it. If you are doing something different in the methodology, you can focus on the methods of the different researchers, whether they were qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods have been used, what method you are going to use in your study and how is it going to be different from the others. Now, there are different types of literature review. The first one is the narrative literature review. This is often referred to as the traditional literature review system. In this, we critic literature, we summarize the body of the literature, we draw some conclusions from that, the research gap is identified, there are, have been some inconsistencies in the already existing body of knowledge, and this new research paper or this new research proposal how is this going to refine? It will shape further research questions. It will lead to developing of theoretical or some kind of conceptual frameworks which have not been previously considered or previously published. For a narrative literature review, you need to have a sufficiently focused research question, a very specific research question to conduct a, this kind of literature review. Giving you an example of a narrative literature review, this is a paper that I had published as e-learning adoption by the undergraduate architecture students. What were the facilitators and inhibitors? This was since published in uh, Emerald, so you can see it again has a structured abstract. Now, in this paper, when we talk about the adoption of e-learning, this paper was basically written up immediately after the COVID and how the entire architecture fraternity shifted from the studios to the laptops and e-learning and all lectures for both the students as well as the faculty. So considering that, this study seeks to respond to following research questions. What are the facilitators that motivate the students to adopt e-learning in the architecture course? And what are inhibitors? Or what is that that discourages them to adopt e-learning? These were the two specific questions that this paper delved in to answer. Now, if you look at the literature review section, there is a paragraph where we talked about whatever studies has been done. Then we moved to the theoretical models. And if you look at this, we're talking about UT, AUT2, UT. These are different models on the basis of which previous researchers have evaluated e-learning adoption, but this was not done in this field of architecture. So the best option for organizing this literature review was on the basis of the theoretical part, the theories done. So what we did, we listed the various theories in this, as you can see, number one, TRA, which is the theory of reasoned action. This was done in 1975, then so on in 1977, then TPB, which came in 1985. And the last column also tells you the key constructs, the key themes which were identified by these theories and how this research paper will take a cue from all these constructs and develop a new model. So UTAUT is by Venkatesh, which is a very common theory, which is a very prevalent theory for the calculation of e-learning adoption in different domains and the adoption and use of technology and people's acceptance. And there was a UTA to two, which is a modification of the previous one, a step ahead of that. So we used UTA UT two model to evaluate e-learning adoption by the undergraduate architecture students. So taking a cue from the different concepts on the basis of the literature review, this conceptual model was developed for this study, <coughs> where different themes were identified, expectancy, effort expectancy, facilitating social influence, and so on. <clears throat> as well as some risks were identified, psychological, technological, what were the inhibitors that people face generally for adopting and especially the students' adoption, acceptance to e-learning. Another paper giving you an example, this was an examining teacher satisfaction in the domain of online hospitality, travel and tourism education system. So on the basis of literature review, we could see different themes that have been worked upon by different researchers, like these seven, eight themes, if you can see in the red box, 
the teacher's performance expectancy, what is the teacher's effort expectancy, his performance anxiety, how does he engage his students in the class, digital competence, and so on. And on the basis of these constructs, we created our uh, research questionnaire. And on the basis of that questionnaire, a mathematical validation was done to prove new results, to give something which has not been researched further. So basically, if you're doing an effective literature review, you're identifying all the key terms very well that have been defined in your area of research and then moving on to the validation of new uh, parameters. In this, we added the teacher satisfaction as a new parameter, and then we moved on to the further statistical validation of these parameters. Another type of literature review that is very commonly used nowadays is systematic literature review. This undertakes a more rigorous approach. The previous one that you saw that was completely manual. You have to go through hundreds paper, 200, 250 papers, and then zero down to the key themes and then work further. But systematic literature review is comprehensive. It details the time frame within which the literature was selected. And this is basically divided into two categories. One is called meta-analysis and the other is meta-synthesis. Now, meta-analysis, this includes findings from several studies again, but only referring to those studies which have some kind of mathematical or statistical procedures in them. However, meta-synthesis talks about all those non-statistical techniques. It integrates, evaluates, interprets the findings of multiple qualitative research studies. And I've already explained, qualitative is something which is not measurable and quantitative is one that has been validated using statistical procedures. And so we call it a quantitative approach. Giving you a glimpse of a paper, this is designed for human well-being, the integration of neuroarchitecture and design. So the research questions that were framed for this systematic review were, what is neuroarchitecture of the built environment? What are the pillars? What is its role towards human well-being? So if you look carefully at the methodology section of this paper, the first thing they mentioned is the multiple databases that have been used to collect literature for this particular paper. And Web of Science, Science Direct, Scopus, Wiley, Abesco, these are different search engines, different databases from where the papers were retrieved. Then there is a fixed timeline, 2015 to 2022, for the past eight years, what has been, whatever has been published in this area has been considered. You also talk about the type of information that is searched, that is reported, and everything that is done is done within a known time frame. Most of the reviews conducted 17 years, studies carried out in the recent, whatever has been done in that particular time frame of eight years. And when you further develop your uh, methodology section, your research design section, this is from one of the papers that I had published with my scholar. It talks about the search strategies. It will give you the databases that were searched for this particular study. It says records identified. Now this was through Google Scholar. Google Scholar is a wide platform. It will give you a list of all papers from Scopus, Web of Science and so on. So we preferred to use Google's Google Scholar and we could see some 1,000, I mean 12,590 articles on that area. Then we filtered those articles using a filter range, which is 2005 to 2020, 15 years, then screening the patent citation. Sometimes you get articles which are not full, you only find their abstracts. So there are several inclusion and exclusion criteria. You segregate pa research papers from book chapters, you segregate research papers from non full text articles, which in this case was n is equal to 18, which is the number. They were all left, they were not included, and ultimately applying the various criteria, the number of research papers were zero down to 35. And on the basis of those 35, further analysis was conducted. Now, when we talk about systematic review, there is another word that is very commonly used nowadays for review. 
that is the bibliometric analysis. I'm going to show you a paper uh, from architecture domain only that was published in ECAM, which is a very well-known architecture journal. I had recently reviewed this paper and it is now published. So this paper was based on bibliometric analysis where you, now you talk about a systematic literature review. This is computer assisted review methodology. This is not a manual methodology because you cannot screen something like 12,000 or 15,000 manuscripts and can identify research or authors. This can only be done by using your computer technology. So this will give you by covering all the publications related to a given topic or a field. Now, bibliometric analysis will help you with database selection. So this particular database referred to Web of Science. The time frame was 1996 to 2020. If you log on to their system, there are uh, independent tabs. You can set in these parameters that I need only papers from Web of Science or I need only papers that are Scopus Index. Then my time frame is this. My search design will lead to these many publications. Then there are different softwares where you put in these information and how bibliometric analysis is done. Those software can be Vosfewer, it can be Bibliosheny, it can be SiteSpace. And all the students who are attending today's session, these uh, there are YouTube videos available. How can you feed in this information and how you can get the bibliometric analysis? map so this authorship pattern the cluster analysis everything can be done easily using the software was viewer the images i am showing they've been created from was viewer so what kind of images will you look at actually before writing you should know what you're looking at so this can be on the basis of authorship pattern and collaborations these are these are some of the key uh, areas in which the maps and patterns are being developed through bibliometric analysis, and they are being widely published nowadays. So the first is the authorship pattern, their collaborations, how many authors, how many authors have collaborated, what are the productive countries who are publishing in this area, what are the typical keywords that were used to search this particular set of papers, influential journals, which publish these kind of research paper, the growth trend, thematic evaluations, they form different clusters and these red, yellow, green lines, they are all generated through WAS Viewer. And this gives you the cluster of uh, work that has been done on the research area under which you are searching for papers and conducting a literature review. Ultimately, on the basis of that bibliometric analysis, you frame your research design. This table is the search strategies applied while searching those sources. So the first thing is the study design, where you talk about the literature review, you say you determine the research gap, determination of the aim and objectives of the study. Moving to the data collection, we talk about the data retrieval. What were the determinants for the search query? What was the selection criteria? Con con se databases apne dale, web of science, scopus, Google Scholar, whatever. Publication type, there was no restriction. So it ultimately zero down to n is equal to some 462 scopus indexed papers. Language was not a restriction. So then you have your inclusion exclusion criteria. People who are good at both the languages may refer to both the papers sometimes if you're not good at both the language so we add an exclusion criteria that the papers other than the language english should be rejected so from here you start zero down and then the data pre-process the fine editing keyword standardization then you're applying that software science mapping Aapne kis kis area mein kis tarha ke maps develop karne hai. can be the publication source ki kaha kaha paper publish hai. keyword analysis whatever keywords were used to search all those scholar analysis that who whoever has published a paper in this area were scholars from where the country institution analysis document analysis so this can it gives you so basically a bibliometric analysis paper will give you a wide frame of information on how you search that what were the keywords what were the subject headings what search terms were used any kind of search technique that was employed inclusion exclusion criteria how you combined your search terms. So basically this kind of table is very important in a bibliometric analysis review paper. 
ultimately doing all this literature review leads to determination of new research areas and determination of the future research directions. Again, the motive, the objective behind a research study is same, that is adding something to the existing domain of knowledge through your research study. So I'll show you some of the glimpses of the maps that have been developed by uh, in a bibliometric analysis paper and the paper that I'm using is uh, sourced right below it, investigating the impact of emerging technologies on construction safety performance. And it says number of publications, so if their time frame was from 1986 to 2021, you see a very interesting map that comes before you that there was only one paper published in this area in 1986. So that was the first paper. And then moving on till today in 2021, you have 52 papers that have been Scopus indexed in the same area. And this cannot be manually done. So we need the help of the uh, computer technology. Then is the number of publications by sources beginning from 2000 to again 2021, whatever number of documents have been published by each of the journal, Automation in Construction 61, that is the top 38 in Journal of Construction Management, so 120 in some other, 8 in computing. And when you, you know, uh, do a bibliometric analysis, these kind of maps also help you to decide your target journal where you can send your paper. And this paper I found very interesting because these the authors, when they saw that there were only eight papers published in Engineering, Construction, Architecture, Management, ECAM journal. So they had targeted their new paper in 2022 in the same journal, and which was readily accepted because this was a new area for their journal. Again, some of the maps, these are all software developed and they can be done seeing the YouTube videos. Uh, keyword co-occurrence map, that these were the different keywords that were used by the, obviously the computer will help you, but it will not identify the keywords for you. You have to manually read the available literature and then identify the keywords because without keywords, this entire system, the entire analysis doesn't work. So health and safety, safety engineering, construction equipment, construction activities. So these are some of the keywords which you put in the system using and or and then analysis. Then this is another uh, map from Wiley of the co-citation network of the articles. Uh, it shows Bhardwaj in 2010 published, then Bhardwaj, all those green lines going down that he collaborated with Barnesh and so many other scholars. So this will give you a network of all the scholars in your area who have published seminal papers in this area of research. Then moving on to the cluster analysis, this gives you an shows you the citations. Now, there was a paper that has been published on consumer perception, attitude, behavior towards some luxury products by some journal. So it says 489 citations under this, 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 then cluster to 609 citations for the theme area, sustainable luxury. So basically, these are modern ways of doing, new ways of doing bibliometric analysis, analyzing and doing a literature review. This also helps you to identify the area of research. Sometimes you may pick up an area with 489 citations because this is something which is widely read and papers are being published. And if you have something substantial to add to this area, some of the authors may find it challenging to use an area which has only 81 citations, which is globalization, and may need may want to work in an area so that their paper, which is a new effort in that area, is more cited and it gets more response from the other authors. I hope uh, everybody is familiar with the word citation. It means when I'm publishing a paper, if my paper is being referred by any other scholar in his study, that is the citation I receive when he refers it, when he sources it. And in my paper, whatever sources, whatever previous literature I am using by all the other authors, I have to mention it as an in-text citation very clearly, as well as at the end in the reference section. 
I'm just giving you a glimpse moving to the closing of this uh, end part. Why did I say in the first slide that you need to establish novelty and research gap in right in the beginning in your abstract so that the reader or the publisher or the reviewer is compelled to read your paper. So this is a screenshot where uh, papers are being sent to the reviewers to review. So while I was reviewing, this is a screenshot of that. The first section that any reviewer is asked to fill in is originality. Does the paper contain new and significant information adequate to justify the publication? So this section, the answer to this section lies in the abstract and from the abstract in your introduction section, you need to have a complete thorough literature review to be able to establish the novelty, which is the originality of your research and the research gap that you're going to address. And that is how you will call it a new and significant information adequate enough to justify. So as a reviewer, every paper that I receive, I have to mention the research gap that particular study has addressed and how is it novel in terms of the other research that has already been published. The second section, why I said in all the components of the paper, literature review is a very important section because it comes right at the top relationship to the literature. And if you carefully, uh, carefully read the parameters, it says, does the paper demonstrate an adequate understanding of the relevant literature in the field, which means whatever previous studies, previous research papers, seminal studies have already been published in the field, have they been considered? Have they been read? Have they been well cited? An appropriate range of literature sources is any significant work in ignored. Sometimes as a reviewer, I may find a research paper that you haven't referred in your study. By chance, you know, you missed that research study. So under this section, I will send you a comment that this particular significant or seminal study in your area has been missed by you. So you need to add it to your paper for your paper to get selected in the next review session. So again, this will depend on the norms of journal uh, where you are sending your paper. But a literature review, identification of research gap and novelty, all will help you identifying the thorough area that you're researching, getting in knowledge with it, and then placing your research study in the previous context, which is very important. Some tips for uh, doing an uh, effective uh, literature review. Try experimenting with different search terms. As a beginner, as a student, when you're not well-versed with the key themes, now since you all have to develop a paper which you may submit for your national seminar, so start experimenting with these search terms. You use, you're use talking about sustainability, right sustainability, sustainable environment, sustainable management, sustainable practices, uh, world uh, sustainable goals, sustainable development. So these are different, different key terms you will put on the Google Scholar of any kind of database or search engine, and you will retrieve different, different research papers, and then you can analyze which one is best suited to your area. Keep an accurate record of all those sources from where you have reviewed, you've collected your papers. It is very important to make a bibliography, a reference section at the end of your journal. You need a summary sheet. You can either use it by hand, you can use a computer, you can create an Excel sheet. Then you need to have to create a logical structure for the LR, which I already said can be on the basis of theme, can be chronologically, identified can be on the basis of author can be on the basis of methodology again it is your choice make sure your research comes forth clearly very crisply the research question that you're going to answer be very very selective in accommodating in selecting these papers for your research because whatever you put on google it gives you a vast data bank of research papers and summarize your key findings what is your research question? What are you going to add? What will your findings be? How will they help the other researchers and the entire fraternity? That is very important. There, there is no thumb rule for a good literature review, but these are a few tips that you can follow for 
conducting a good literature review. And last of all, the references which are at the end, they are mandatory. Typically, it includes the author's name, date, location. There is a DOI, which we call the Digital Object Identifier. This is a unique number that is allotted to the each paper that is published. And then so on, you can identify that paper with that clicking on that DOI. It's an active link. So I'll show you two examples. If you are using for a conference a reference, it has to be with the year, month, mentioning in where the conference was published like 2021 third international sustainability and so on conference page number published by the publisher which was the IEEE explored proceedings in this case if you are referring a paper from a journal it can be the name of the author beginning with the surname the year and the name of the paper the name of the journal is generally in italics volume number issue number and again the doi the reference style will vary from journal to journal where you are publishing generally in architecture and social sciences we follow the apa style there are different referencing style i'll give you a quick tip to identify supposedly i was looking for a paper on naturalistic inquiry published by Bhandari. So I received this paper and below you can see a star, save, and then cite. These are two uh, commas. You click these commas and you receive a list something like this, which will give you different referencing style, MLA style, APA style, Chicago style, Harvard, Vancouver. These are some which are inbuilt in the Google Scholar of your computer, your MS office. So you can use any of these directly. Like for example, if I'm writing a paper generally in architecture, we follow the APA style. So I'll pick up the reference from here. But if you carefully look at the APA reference that I'm showing you, it has shown the name of the paper, the author, but it is not showing me the page number. It says International Journal, volume eight, issue three, but page number is missing. So some of the journals like Emerald, like Sage, they, it is mandatory to mention the page number. So you need to go and click on the journal, identify the page number and add a comma and then write the page number. You can write PP with the page number. So I'm telling you this because this will be useful and you need to use this for the national seminar also. There can be two ways of referencing whatever literature you have collected. One is the in-text citation that we use in the body of the paper. For example, Alexander P.A. 2018. This is the reference, the entire thing. If I am using it in the body of my paper, as I am showing you one of my papers, Featherman and Pavlo 2003, something which I have taken from their paper. I say they measured the concept of perceived usage risk. But if I am quoting something, for example, I say Bhandari et al. in 2020 tested five risks, then I have to mention it as a narrative citation. There is a difference in the brackets between the parenthetical citation and the narrative citation, and both of these are used in the research paper. See, you can see both of them are used. So all this citing, you must be thinking, why is it important to cite an article? Why do you have to write the other author's name in your paper? Because this will save you from plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you don't say where you took it from, moral, legal, it is copyright infringement when you take it without permission. So in both the cases, whether you are taking somebody's text without permission, you are passing it, off as your own work it is called plagiarism there are various levels of plagiarism by each institute by each journal they have their own norms generally for a conference they accept 10 to 15 percent of plagiarism and for a high-end journal for a research paper it has to be below 10 percent some of the very highly indexed journals with higher h index they even go down below to 5%. So basically, friends, copying anything without permission is stealing and you are a thief in that case. So please avoid plagiarism. Some of the references that I had referred for using this presentation. And I very um, strongly believe the formulation of the problem is often more essential than its solution. When you frame a research paper, when you identify your problem area, that is more essential rather than what your findings lead to. Your findings may be different from the already established findings. They may match the already established findings that will not 
uh, that's nothing to worry about that is nothing to be thought but the process you followed to frame that research problem and develop it into a research objective and then finding the solution is more important thank you very much for any queries you can always get back my email id is mentioned below thank you thank you ma'am for the wonderful presentation literature review has always been a soft corner whenever we are writing a paper or doing a research so how to write it in a proper way the way the journals want us to write is really very helpful usually we write but they are not very systematic and we always get a mail from the journal that please give more references please elaborate on the literature review put it more systematically so this has been very helpful at least to me this has been very helpful i am sure mm -hmm. others will also find it important i hope research. i finished it in time so that we can have questions if anybody has actually ma'am the presentation is the starting step for anyone to write and they can start up on a strong foundation now uh, basically they now know like how to write and then how to refer and then uh, definitely way to look for material uh, the topics that you are interested what is happening so the foundation like with this presentation everyone can start with a strong foundation that's uh, that that is the uh, way the whole presentation was there and i'm very thankful for that thank you <laughs> any questions anybody Yeah, you can ask or you should be asking rather than chatting. If you want, you can write in the chat box also. <laughs> yes, we will share the recording. Actually, School of Architecture, Geetam has a YouTube channel. So we will be hosting all the videos on that. So Saponi will definitely send the link. To those uh, videos, all the three uh, and the next coming two also uh, will be hosting. Yeah. So, if there are no more questions, should we close the session for today? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Some more question session is uh, all the time like this. <laughs> Not many people uh, right now are asking questions. I don't know why. <laughs> right. It was a wonderful presentation, ma'am. That was. Uh, Thank great. you so much, sir. Thank yeah. you. But if uh, still they have any questions, you can always get them to me. You can connect them to me or they can email it to me. Yes, I am yes. always willing to answer the queries and especially students because in our school also we are trying to train them in research writing and we are taking sessions and we recently started a very interesting initiative which is called CRIS. So we yes. allotted, uh, we, you know, asked the students to make groups among themselves and then we allotted them a teacher as a mentor. So they yes. were collaborating and writing some of the manuscripts. So whatever quality, we'll assess it later and may then, you know, submit it for some conference or for a journal, depending upon the quality. But yes. again, the idea is the same to prepare our students into research writing so that when they pass out from here and they move on for their higher studies also, they know how it has to be done. So actually in a university environment, uh, there is a competition because engineering, science, pharmacy, they submit so many papers yeah. uh, at an average of two papers per faculty and in architecture, uh, yeah. it's really spare. So we thought like <clears throat> we, we have to inculcate this mm -hmm. as a experience for them. So we started- Absolutely, the architecture faculty is also not very pro to writing. Yes, so yes. that is also something we have to look forward because now we are being compared to the other disciplines and domains and we are being asked that yes. since but we, we are definitely doing so much of research, but somehow we've not been documenting that research in the yes. form of a research. Well, actually, project. every project done by an architect is a research project, but the documentation is not effective and 
definitely documentation uh, as uh, needed by journals that is very important so so i saw uh, your uh, poster for the national seminar and it had uh, entries for the phd scholars also so yes. we have 14 scholars enrolled here so i circulated the poster and i'm asking them to go and attend and yes. definitely present a paper in the uh, symposium so ma'am you are welcome to hyderabad if you are free at that time we'll make arrangements and then you can uh, make a presentation at the hyderabad at hyderabad definitely i love to be a part of it yes yes ma'am <clears throat> ours is a very young school so we are just starting off and uh, uh, Soponi is uh, taking care of our research so that is the reason she started this initiative and we would like to continue this initiative thank you so much thank you dr paul for inviting me for this session and i hope thank you ma'am for being benefited too. and they have some idea what is the literature review, narrative, bibliometric analysis. I thought since these are students, so they may be very much interested in how computer does it, you know, because the manual is a little tedious process, but nowadays they are very technology savvy. So they really, you know, log in YouTube and learn these softwares and then they are using it very easily. They are better in using technology than us. Yes. I'm actually in YouTube, I saw some videos and there are videos excellent made in Hindi language, actually. Yeah. Very excellent videos on research methodologies in Hindi rather than in English. So I like actually got hooked up and I was actually watching many videos in Hindi on research methods. Okay. <laughs> so there is a lot of content that is available, but uh, information is not knowledge. So they have to process that information so that it becomes knowledge. Everyone has to apply that. So the whole efforts are for that. So you Absolutely. <clears throat> seek knowledge, then absorb it, and then make it as a knowledge for you. That all the information that is there. Yes. Yeah. So only if you can make an announcement about the next webinar, no, it becomes easier. But then. Yes, sir. So the next webinar is being hosted by Dr. Faiz Ahmed from SPA Vijayawada, and he will take a session for around one hour on use of artificial intelligence in research writing. So I'm sure that is going to be very interesting. So that is on the next Saturday, 27th of May, same time. Right. And I request everyone to please uh, uh, ask your friends to participate and uh, make these uh, sessions useful for everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hopefully, we can close. Yes, sir.